the brain that is changing itself. A uh, presentation that I was happily uh, given to share from Dr. John Kelly. It's exciting news. And it's not the brain that can change itself, but the brain that is changing itself, even right now as I speak. So I'm going to be talking about neuroplasticity. So let me start off by asking you, are you aware that there are two hearts in the human body? Of course, some may people will say, well, that's great because, you know, I think I'm going to need a backup. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about that there are two hearts in the human body. One heart resides, of course, in our chest, about the size of our fist. And this is the heart we're most familiar with. In fact, it's arguably the, the organ that gets the most attention in the body because uh, more money is spent on the heart than any other organ in the <clears throat> organ system in the body. A very large share of medical cost is spent maintaining, fixing, and repairing the pump in the chest. So the chest heart beats 30 million times a year, and you can do that arithmetic yourself and you just assume 60 beats a minute that works out to about 2.5 billion times in a lifetime. The first fetal tissue that we can actually see with the naked eye is the heart and it's not because it's so large but because it's pulsatile it's moving and you can see the moving tissue before you can see almost anything else and before there is blood. Your heart has been beating before it had blood to circulate, before you even had blood vessels. You know, if the heart stops beating for a few seconds, you may pass out. And if it remains stopped for a few minutes, you not, might not wake up. So it's no wonder that this heart gets so much attention and why it's so important to everyone. But there's another heart. For example, the Ancient Bible scriptures talk about that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. This indicates that we're probably talking about the brain, the frontal lobes of the brain, the exec center of executive function. And whereas the chest is continually, chest heart is continually beating, and it's been beating since before you were born, the brain is continually making new connections. It used to be thought about 20 years ago that the brain, if destroyed, is irreplaceable, the brain tissue. But now we know that there are stem cells and new neurons being produced. Now the size of our cranium at birth is not much different than it is as an adult. So the question begs, how is it that we get a lifetime of information stored in the space without taking up any more space. And if we could solve that problem in our own closets or cupboards at home, uh, we'd be in really good shape. So we can store, it appears, endless amounts of information in the same space. And the point is, it's a neural network. You can look that up, neural network. It's the most information dense structure that science knows of at this time and it's because of the connections we don't have to have more neurons to store information we just need more connections between the neurons so we know that we can make and are making new neurons however that's not the primary way that we learn new things that that's just sort of a maintenance and repair system some of you might have heard of Phineas Gage, a very interesting gentleman, and he's still famous in our present time. Phineas Gage actually lived in the 1800s and he had an accident that made him famous. Here is Phineas uh, in the picture posing after his accident. And he kind of looks like a soldier from a civil war or something with his rifle. But if you look closely, that is actually not a rifle. That is called a tamping rod because Phineas Gage worked on engineering projects and his job was to tamp the dirt and rock after they dug the holes 
and placed explosives in them. And so why would they do that? Well, that's so that when they set off the explosive, it wouldn't just blow out the hole, but rather it would stay down there and blow up what they were trying to uh, move. And one day, yes, as he was tamping with that rod, uh, the unthinkable happened. And the dynamite, the explosive, was accidentally ignited and it turned his tamping rod into a missile. And that rod went right up through Phineas's eye socket and out through the top of his head. If you look at the picture, you can see the normal eye on the right and he has his eye closed or missing on the left. So how do we know all this? Well, this is the preserved cranium or skull from his skeleton and it's kept at Stanford University in California. And here you can see the damage um, that happened at the top of his skull. Now, what this is, is an article published in 2012, and they're using computer simulation to study what happened to Phineas's brain as a result of his accident. And you're going to see why they're so interested in that in just a minute. Here are some of the simulation models looking at various connections of the brain that were destroyed. It actually destroyed a good portion of his frontal lobes. So these images came from this article in 2012. And the reason they're so interested in this is not only because, well, Phineas actually survived this amazing traumatic event, but because it dramatically changed his personality and his character. And that is why um, they're, they're preserved his skull and they're they're still studying it. it it's um, in the paper and print of the time when he was alive. It was dramatic. They noted how dramatically this man changed. So whereas Phineas had been before the accident, a very reliable employee, a faithful family man, a good friend, an upright citizen. Um, after his accident, he became so that he couldn't hold a job. In fact, he didn't care. He didn't want to hold a job. Uh, he became what is called a profligate. Uh, that's what the newspapers were calling him at the time. And he ended up traveling to South America, spending all his money, got himself in debt, and ended up returning to the United States where he died in San Francisco, the port of San Francisco which is near Stanford University. And that's how Stanford University ended up with his, his body and his skull. So the story of Phineas Gage was one of the earliest indications of the significance of the brain heart, as it's called, the center of executive function and control in the frontal lobes of your brain. So the two hearts, we've talked about two of them now let me bring another thought to your mind. Um, I can remember when I, me, I first saw uh, heart surgery, open heart surgery. I wasn't there present in the room. I watched it on a television screen. Um, but I remember thinking, wow, I mean, it is shocking. It's, uh, they take a saw, they cut the sternum apart, and they open up that chest cavity and it is, it's amazing. Now, in the light of amazing things, a heart transplant is amazing. And, you know, they take the person, put them asleep, cut open their sternum, stop the heart, take it out of their chest and keep them alive, put someone else's heart in, put it all back together, and then get them uh, starting to breathe again. And, you know, it's quite amazing that even today, they did quite a few of them today in your country and my country. And, you know, it wasn't even in the newspaper because we're, we're so used to it. It's like, well, yeah, big deal. Well, it's a really big deal if it happens to you, right? So this is a really big deal that you can do that. So... Now, do you know that they are actually doing 
brain transplants. You're like, whoa, no. Well, they are. Not on humans that's, you know, being widely reported or anything, but they are doing it on primates. And they are pursuing the ability to do this. So you're probably thinking, wow, wow, wow. A, a heart transplant is a donor heart, but a brain transplant is a like a donor body. I mean, so like who wants to have somebody else's brain in their body? I mean, who are they then? And, and I mean, it doesn't really solve the problem, does it, you know? So now they're, so they're trying to achieve this. And um, it's like, I don't think they're going to have a big rush to it. I haven't met anybody that's interested in having a brain transplant. It's an interesting thought, isn't it? So the point here is, is that the cranial heart, this one is the most important. Um, so if we get a heart transplant, why are we doing it? It's really for our, our brain, isn't it? Because we want to be alive. We want to be us. We want to keep going. Uh, it's obviously not about the chest heart. We're willing to give that one away. But... You want to give away your brain? I haven't met anybody yet that wants to do that or even considered that. What we really need is a fix for our brains when they get sick or when they get injured. In other words, we don't want to replace it, I don't think. I don't. So wouldn't it be nice if we could just, like, rewire it? Or wouldn't that be great? Now, if our brain was... Uh, a type of computer we could just you know reboot restart and get the memory back up restored well i have good news guess what at this moment while you're sitting here listening to this presentation your brain is rewiring and that's what i want to show you it is absolutely amazing it's happening right now and it will be happening when you go to sleep tonight and it's happening all the time. Neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity changes everything. It literally does. And by the time I finish this talk, I hope you'll see why I'm saying that neuroplasticity changes everything. Now, is the brain, is it hardwired? I mean, that's what was more or less thought. Some people, you know, could just, well, our brains are hardly wired. And there's a little humor in that but hardly wired in the sense that it's soft wired. It's much more like a computer memory than it is some kind of wiring board or the old telephone switchboards from way back when. Um, there's a book out by a doctor named Norman Deutsch, and it's called The Brain That Changes Itself. And I'm going to be sharing a few stories from his book. It's a very interesting book. The most valuable real estate on the planet is not, well, over here it would be like Beverly Hills, California, or maybe in Australia it would be Bellevue Hill, Sydney, or some famous resort-like location. The most valuable real estate on the planet is brain real estate. Brain real estate is the most valuable real estate that we have and guess what it's sold to the highest bidder your brain real estate is being sold to the highest bidder and is being used for what you ask your brain to do so every day in your life um this real estate builds up over a period of weeks and our brain is is being used for the things that we de most demand of it. So stick with me here. So you're going to see. Science has discovered that a brain is a lot like bone. Uh, we used to, uh, uh, we thought of bone for so long like a hard piece of concrete. You know, it's just hard and solid. But do you know that your bones are actually living and changing continually? Bones are not hard. Um, they're, they're hard in the sense of 
like being strong, but they're not, you know, they're full of living cells and bone is constantly being taken down and replaced, kind of like the roads on the highways uh, around the place. Um, when you break a bone, the body instantly starts repairing it. Um, and it's within, you know, a week, it's already hardened up in its place. And it's only six weeks after the accident um, that, you know, it's, it's healed. They take the cast off. It's strong enough that it's going to stay there. Um, and so that process, people think, you know, I have a friend that just got their child got a broken collarbone. And it's not quite set perfectly smooth the way it had been. And she was worried, oh, no, it's, there's this big bump and what's going to happen? And, but my husband was, uh, you know, worked with orthopedic, he was an orthopedic surgeon. And bones keep remodeling. They keep moving, changing, and getting itself right over a period of two years. And so if you break a bone now, and two years from now they take um, uh, x-ray, Sometimes they can't even tell that it had been broken. So um, they're remodeling. They're alive, the cells. And so our brain is like bone in that we know that the brain is constantly doing the rewiring. Um, it doesn't take, it doesn't have to be like after some injury like Phineas Gage had. Um, it's not only after an injury. It's just continual. So the brain is continually being rewired or remapped. This gets real exciting. I want to talk to you a little bit about Dr. Paul Bacarita, who died in 2006. And this is a photo and the only one we could find of him in his actual lab. And Dr. Bacarita was an American physician, a neuroscientist, and he was a maverick. His most notable field of work was in neuroplasticity. Here's another picture of him at a conference. And we're going to come back to this lady standing next to him in the red in a few minutes. But I wanted to tell you about Dr. Paul Bacarita's father, Pedro. Pedro Bacarita um, had a disabling stroke at age 65. His wife had already died. So he was a widower, and he had this massive stroke that left him completely paralyzed on one side, and he was unable to walk or speak. And he couldn't care for himself. He had to have someone care for him, and he had two sons. And we've already mentioned Paul, and at that time, Paul was in residency, you know, after medical school. So he was way too busy, could not take care of his father. His other son, George, was still in medical school. And so Pedro moved to Mexico and to be with George, where George was at school, and be with him while he was trying to recover from the stroke. So the short version of a long story is that George did not know much about how to rehabilitate somebody after having had a stroke. So George and his dad got together and kind of figured out that people learn to walk, you know, by crawling. And so George had Pedro try to start crawling. And, and, and you know, he's totally paralyzed on one side, so he just flop over. So they, they're thinking together and, and, okay, let's try this, Dad. And he takes his dad and gets him on the floor next to a wall and props him up on his paralyzed side against the wall. So he's got his most strong side, and he can just kind of scoot with the strong side and lean against that wall on the paralyzed side. And people in New Mexico learned about this, and they began giving George a hard time for what he was doing with his father and treating his father like this. They were horrified. Um, but he and his father ignored it and continued on. And what's interesting is that they modeled 
Pedro's rehabilitation after infant development, which they later found on, was really not a bad model after all. They began playing ball on the floor and like a baby, and eventually, long story short, Pedro did learn how to walk again, and he learned how to talk again, and then he wanted to go back to work. Uh, he was very forward-thinking, Pedro, and, and we should take note of this. He was determined he wanted to get back to health, to recover from the stroke. We should not sell ourselves short, but be forward-thinking. Now, this was back in the 1960s, and in his work, he needed to be able to type. And you remember back, well, some of you may know, but back then, typewriters were manual, and you had to have really strong fingers and hands to type on these uh, keys. And so they designed specific exercise to develop his motor skills to be strong enough to use a manual typewriter. And so eventually Pedro regained all function and did go back to work. Back to work? He was a professor in New York City. He remarried, he retired, and he died about seven years later from a massive heart attack while climbing somewhere in the Andes Mountains of South America. There had been an agreement between Pedro and his two sons, his two doctor sons, that when he died, they all wanted to have an autopsy of his brain to prove the recovery of his brain because it was so obvious that he had recovered and that was considered impossible to recover. So they got a lady, a friend, uh, probably a Dr. Aguiar, Mary Jean Aguiar, who prefer, performed the autopsy. And what she found was not at all what they were expecting. So she found a massive area of the brain that had been destroyed by the stroke and was not recovered. Uh, a brain that could never have done what he did going back to work as a professor and remarrying and, and, and the whole nine yards. Uh, one of the parts of Pedro's brain was the brain stem. It was 90% dead in this man who had been living and functioning, fun functioning normally. That, that's, that's incredible, 90% of his brain stem. And so it was not like this man's brain had somehow healed. He had massive death on one side of his brain and 90% of dead tissue in the brain stem. And this shocked all of them. They're all doctors going, this is impossible. What used to be taught was that there are anatomical brain uh, areas of the brain that did certain things. But now we understand that's not true. And we're not saying that parts of the brain don't do certain things. They do. But it's not hardwired that way. Uh, for example, there's plenty of evidence and proof for people um, or animals who are born without sight um, that it's not like there's a part of the brain that's just sitting there useless. The brain does use it, but it it, use, it does something else with it. Um, for example, okay, so sight is usually thought to be primarily processed in the occipital lobe of the brain. They've done studies of people who are born blind and learn to read Braille, you know, with your fingers feeling. They've mapped their occipital um, lobe in their brain and they showed that in that area of the brain, that's where the brain is using to read the braille with their fingers, with, with feel, sensory feel, no eyesight. Isn't that interesting that that, that part of the brain, you, normally where you see, is being used to read braille. But when you think about it, braille sort of like seeing, isn't it? And so it's only with touch instead of sight. Okay, so the brain is much more flexible, pliable, and plastic. All right, so let me show you that rewiring of the brain happens not only after a stroke. Here is a really amazing story. 
Okay, we're going back to Cheryl Schlitz. Cheryl was a patient of Dr. Paul Bacuritas. Now remember, Pedro was his father who had the stroke. But as a result of what Paul came, became convinced of as a result of what had happened to his father, he then started working and became known as the man who could connect anything to anything. You would think, it, I would think it would have been George who was rehabilitating his, his father, but no, Paul became just obsessed and fascinated with this. He was the pioneer of neuroplasticity. Let me give you an illustration. Um, you know the space station and then we have astronauts out in space and you know they wear these big big suits you know that have to be totally airtight <clears throat> and sometimes they have to go out and repair that that space station and you're thinking well, how do they how in the world could they feel anything in a suit you know if you have any mechanics out there you know you, you can't wear a big giant suit and try and screw in a uh, a screw or a bolt or something like that. Well, Dr. Paul Bacarita invented what's called a, a brain port. Um, and so this thing, our tongues are very sensitive um, and they have sen the most sensory dense of all of our body is our tongue. So he made this device that sits on your tongue and then it gives indications by pulses of what it, it's wired to. So he's put this thing and it, it can make the uh, astronaut feel even though he can't feel. If that makes any sense, it's like a sensor. That's what he's invented. So um, that man made it possible, Dr. Paul Bacarita. So let's see. Um, now, Cheryl. Cheryl had an infection, uh, was treated with gentamicin. And any physicians or medical professionals out there know very well that gentamicin can have a very unfortunate side effect. Um, you don't give a person this drug for too long or too much because it can do exactly what it did to her. I personally know somebody that took that uh, medication and went completely deaf. <clears throat> became deaf. Um, so what it did to Cheryl was that Cheryl lost 95 to 100% of her vestibular function in her brain. And the vestibular function is the processing system where the inner ear and the brain that gauges your balance. And it wasn't that the drug injured the 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 hearing, the sensory organ, but rather it injured the brain function where balance is processed. Okay, so that's the way it manifested in Cheryl, and and she um, was continually feeling like she was falling constantly. Can you imagine feeling like that? If she closed her eyes, she'd immediately fall over, and um, if she you know, she, I'm able to stand here and, and I know exactly where I am. I'm not falling over, but she couldn't do that. Um, she'd have to stand with a really wide gait where your legs are spread real wide. And she always had to be touching something, like putting her hand somewhere. And it just always felt like she was falling, falling, falling. It was so debilitating. Um, and so for Cheryl, um, she just was so concentrating on the room and orientation and trying to figure out if she was falling. She, she, her movements were shaky, jerky. She was fatigued from this and um, constantly having to focus on the orientation of the room. So she, could, she couldn't take care of herself. She couldn't work. Well, she found... Dr. Paul Bacarita, and he invented an accelerometer. Um, that's the brain port thing. But the, the, and he made this for her in that it, he had this device that, I remember, I said goes on the tongue because your tongue can tell you things. It has lots of 
sensory things. Okay, you kind of have to think about this. So she's got a tongue sensor on and it's mapped to a gyroscope. A gyroscope is something that indicates movement of any kind. And so if you move the accelerometer to the right, then the signal would be on her tongue on the plate that would go to the right and so on. If it went to the left, it go to the left, if it go back. And so pretty soon they put it on her. And after a few minutes of learning, her brain's learning this, of what it's doing, she could actually stand like, like everybody else does. And, and then she started learning how to walk. Like this was, didn't take long. Oh, wow, I can, I, I'm sensing where I am. Her brain picked up on where she was and that what which way was up, right? Vestibular function. And so she finally got brave enough that she, um, she decided to do what, see what always happened was if she shut her eyes, closed her eyes, she'd immediately fall over, down. Um, and that can hurt, right? So she decided, okay, I'm going to try it. I'm going to close my eyes. And she has the device on. She closed her eyes, and then she started to cry because she didn't fall down. Her brain was figuring this out with this device. So after a while, um, she took the device off. She says, Okay, you probably got sick of it. I would get sick of it. But she's like, okay, let's see what happens when I take this device off. And she took it off and another miracle happened. She continued to stand and move like a normal person. And she could even close her eyes like a normal person. And this residual effect continued for minutes the first time. You know, we take it off minutes she still had this but then it wore it kind of wore off and so then she put it back on and the effect continued for and she'd take it off and and then it started lasting for hours like she could take it off for hours and it would still work and then days and then to the point where she no longer needed it somehow her brain rewired remapped and figured out another way to be able to have vestibular function in another part of her brain so that she could tell which way was up and, and you know, upright <laughs> against gravity. Um, that's incredible. So somehow her brain had rewired and connected the things that needed to be connected and was working. And this tells us that the nerves from the various organs are able to be rerouted to different parts of the brain. So, however, Dr. Paul Bakarita's paper, he wrote a paper on this based on her case, and uh, it was largely ignored um, at that time. And he was, he was way ahead of his time. He was, he was figuring things out. And it's now well established that human brain retains the ability to reorganize itself throughout life. Using modern techniques, researchers can observe how the brain rewires itself after injuries. This is so amazing. So, okay, now let's show another example. This is a picture of what's called syndactyly. It's where you're born with webbed... Um, digits, your fingers, your toes, um, somehow when you're, you didn't quite finish in the, in the, your mom's belly or something, <laughs> but they, um, they're webbed together. Okay, so they've mapped this individual's toes to see what's going on in the brain. This is, a, they're studying this, and to see how it maps, and this person maps with only four toes, because those two are you know, web together. Now we can see five toenails, but their brain's only mapping four toes. So then they do the surgery and where they only, it's just tissue, soft tissue, and they separate those two toes 
and now they have five toes. And now those toes can function separately. Okay, so they, and then they watch what the brain does with that. And what the brain does is within a few weeks, few, a few weeks, they start seeing that now the brain is mapping five toes. Isn't that interesting? This is so exciting. So they've even tried it other ways. They've taken um, uh, studies where they'll take monkeys and they'll say, okay, let's sew up two of their digits together and see what the brain does. So the monkey has, I don't know, five digits, and then they sew up two of them and see what happens. And sure enough, over a few weeks, it's instead of being five, it starts mapping to four. Then they thought, oh, let's see if it, what, what happens, what, what your brain does. Let's map, say, the, the uh, thumb and the, the last finger together. And sure enough, the brain compensates. Then it starts looking at it as one. They map together. So the point is, the principle that we learned was that neurons that fire together, wire together. They map together. Okay, here's another example. Uh, this is a picture of Eric Weinmayer, I guess. I'm not sure how he would pronounce it, but I would say Weinmayer. He's blind, and he's an indoor rock climber. And Eric is wearing this thing called the brain port. So he's about to put that thing on his tongue right there in that picture. Okay, and it's wired to, it's connected to the camera that's on his head. Okay, and this camera is um, going to um, help him because Eric is blind and he's a rock climber and he wanted to be able his goal was that he wanted to be able to climb with the same techniques as sighted people. Um, sighted people don't feel where they're going to next. Um, they kind of look, be able to look and see and they almost lunge towards what they're going to grab hold of. And this thing to his tongue could tell him uh, where he's at. And he started climbing like a sighted climber and he's competing and excelling with sided climbers uh, that's another way the brain can work with with information that is not normally you know what i'm saying so neuroplasticity it changes everything it appears that almost nothing in the brain is hardwired and uh, with the research done so far, but that said, there's still always more to explore. And that's why we put the word almost here on the slide. So that neurons that fire together, wire together, as we said, they map together. Not only are neurons from our, or our own organs wiring to our brains, but external devices being used are also wiring to our brain real estate. Have you ever gone to um, a park uh, where they have a skateboard park or a bike park? Or you see these young people with their skateboards or their scooters or their bicycles, and they're just doing the most unbelievable tricks. They can go flipping through the air upside down. Like you would say, that's impossible. It's almost as if their sporting device, like, you know, whatever it is, it's like an extension of their body. They know right where it is. It, it goes around and they're with it and they, they land on it and they keep going. Um, they, they just do impossible things. But now with the knowledge of neuroplasticity, we know that that, whatever it is, scooter, skateboard, bike, it is an appendage. It is mapping to their brain. It becomes an extension of their body, their own body. Uh, you spend enough time with that thing, it, it becomes a part of yourself. The thing's mapping to the brain. So as of recently, some uh, very interesting and sobering research is being done. 
and we're talking about the preschool and early childhood age right now, um, they very often have a small device in their hands. I mean, even schools are putting devices in their hands. And uh, <clears throat> this technology is, promote, is being promoted in most schools. And now research is showing that even these devices are mapping to our brains. That's kind of scary when you think about it. What's it doing? Um, remember, neurons that fire together, wire together. And so it's kind of sobering to think, well, what are, we better watch what we are doing. What do we want to be mapped to and, and mapped with? And, and what does it do to our brains? It's just something to think about. It has serious implications, not only for children, but for us as adults. Now, another thing that's come out of this research is that an experience-rich environment stimulates the brain to develop more robustly. And what do I mean by that? In other words, if you want a brain that has maximum capability, maximum plasticity, maximum functionality, you want to have an experience-rich environment. Not, it's not like sitting in a room with four white walls uh, reading a book um, but it's like you want to you don't have you on the other hand you don't have to have something that's changing every five minutes either so i'll give you an example in nursing homes you know in the old days they they were plain they were just like a hospital or well, even hospitals are changing now but it used to be just four white walls and you just put a patient in there and they sit and they probably die from boredom. Um, <laughs> it's not good. Now what they're doing is they're giving them an experience rich environment. They give them pictures to look at, activities to do. They let pets come in so they can touch them and love them and they give them uh, people to come in and teach them things. They play games in together with them. And so they're finding in nursing homes that people who actually are put into a nursing home that's doing that, they sometimes totally recover from whatever it was they were put into the nursing home for and are able to go back out home um, because they're given a, an um experience rich environment that's stimulating their brains and so um yeah they provide exercise classes you know hobbies and it's just really exciting how that what's happening in this realm so another thing that people can overcome weaknesses with pro um, proper strengthening exercises that remap the brain the proper way uh, I'm no expert on this, but there are specialists that specialize in neuroplasticity to create programs that do. Um, they're designing programs for all ages of people with all kinds of disabilities uh, and seeing really dramatic improvements with remarkable results. Um, they're helping people uh, with children who have autism, uh, people who have had strokes, people who had brain injury, people who have been born without parts of their brain. They're even using it with people like with schizophrenia. Um, it, the field is so new and the full spectrum of results are not fully seen and published yet, but it, it's ongoing. It's, it's a new field and it's, it's happening. There's new stuff they're discovering about the brain and this neuroplasticity all the time. So the point is, it's never too late to improve and strengthen the brain. Um, they've done this with younger people, middle-aged people, and older people. <clears throat> and they're finding it's never too late. They found that a person that had a stroke 20 years ago, and they, you know they have this deficit, this, this problem from a stroke 20 years ago, and they apply programs to them in light of neuroplasticity. And these people are recovering from a 20 year old stroke. It, it's so exciting. Uh, new neuroplasticity is that it keeps 
point is you want to keep your brain strong and healthy and new things. So you see, you know, and I don't want one. And I want to share a Or in the Bible, there's an interesting, it says you a new heart, a new spirit, when you take a heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Now that gives a whole new meaning um, to being hard hearted, doesn't it? You know, and you think, okay, we, we, when we hear the word heart, we always think of that chest heart. And now we can start thinking about the brain, the brain heart. Maybe the Lord was talking about that. What I realized in learning about neuroplasticity is that this rewiring is happening continually. And I think that built into the creator's design is a provision for continual remapping and rewiring of our brain. And science proves or reveals to us that this is happening. <clears throat> Of course, science may differ with us as to whether or not there's a creator, but nonetheless, we agree that this is a property of our brains that is remarkable. So your brain is changing itself right now, tomorrow, constantly, depending on what you're doing with it. And you can't alter that fact. It's changing. So what you can do is this. You can guide and direct <clears throat> that rewiring by choosing what you use your brain for. Now, we don't have anything against crossword puzzles, but what would be much more useful uh, to you is to take up something you have no idea how to do. So for some, it could be bicycling or swimming or art or a musical instrument or a new language. The possibilities are almost limitless. So here are some principles about rewiring the brain, sort of a summary. The first principle is focus. Your brain, <clears throat> you cannot build brain plasticity by doing something that's mindless, something that you can have a conversation uh, while you're doing it. You need to have total focused attention. So you need to pick something brand new to do uh, say like learning a piano or, or and um, spend 60 to 90 minutes most days. How many is most? Four out of seven. Okay. So say four or more days a week, spend 60 to 90 minutes learning something completely new. It, it could be physical, it could be mental, or it could be spiritual. And, but the more complex, the better. The second principle uh, is learning. As I was saying, you can't just practice what you already know. This is for building the strength of your brain, your brain, your brain plasticity, its, its ability, its alacrity, its at rewiring. So it's got to be new. <clears throat> a new career, a new musical instrument, a new hobby, or even deep Bible study. The third principle is sleep. This is becoming more important than we realize. And um, so your brain <clears throat> really is, um, it's important for all kinds of um, functions to get really good regular sleep. Uh, it's, it's, it's critically important re for rewiring the brain. Sleep is key for short-term wiring and, and to be transferred into long-term wiring. It's just, it's critical for health physically and mentally. The fourth principle is food. Can you believe that? <laughs> Rewiring requires good nutrition for both the body and the brain. And it's well studied and well known that foods uh, affect our brains and some make them some foods make it slow, and others overstimulate it, and some foods are tremendously helpful. Diet definitely affects the brain the most 
people realize. Okay, so here's another principle and very interesting, a clear conscience. Rewiring the brain requires a hopeful, guilt-free mind. Um, distraction, consuming of brain injury, uh, energy, sorry, consuming your brain energy on issues of guilt or resentment or problematic relationships, it interferes with rewiring the brain. So um, our, our brain's ability to rewire well needs to have a healthy, hopeful outlook and one without guilt or a troubled conscience. Um, there's uh, books you can read that can help, some, such as like Pathway to Peace or uh, we know of a book called The Law of Life by Dr. Mark Sandoval. That's a very good book. You might want to look that up, The Law of Life by Dr. Mark Sandoval. The last principle for rewiring the brain is optimal circulation and oxidant. This word, I always get messed up. Oxygenation of the brain. Um, this rewiring process cannot happen with, without nutrients and oxygen in the brain. So what you want is good cardiovascular fitness. Exercise is key. And I'll give you uh, an example here. One is that there's a Dr. John Ratey, and he's an associate clinical professor of psychiatry at Harvard. And he's been studying uh, neuropsychiatry and studies of how exercise uh, affects the brain. And he has shown that exercise literally changes the physiological shape of the brain. Um, science shows that exercise has a profound uh, impact on the brain, and it really does in all kinds of ways. Um, there's a story I can tell you quickly that uh, my husband helped a, a man who had, was a nurse anesthetist, and he finished his school, and he needed to pass his boards. And he took the test, failed, took the test a second time, failed, and you're only allowed three times to take it, and then that's it. So he found my husband and said, what do I do? I can't fail it the third time. My family are depending on me to provide, and I've done all this school, and I'm in debt uh, from the school fees, and I've got to pass this test. I've got to pass these boards. And so my husband came up with a plan for him based on these principles we've been talking about. But what was key for him was exercise. So as he's studying and as he's doing, eating well and getting his sleep and, and doing all these things, he was exercising every hour. He run down the driveway, run back, and he's just really working on exercise. What's interesting is that when he went to take that board, that final board test, they, everybody was astounded. Not only did he pass the test, he got 100%. He didn't miss one question. And that was something they, they'd never seen. So and we all knew. We were jumping for joy. I can tell you that. Praising the Lord. All right. So here's a simplified lifestyle prescription for rewiring the brain. Number one, avoid tobacco and alcohol. And, and that's what I, I would call that a no-brainer, right? Ha, ha, ha. No-brainer. Okay. And next, uh, exercise. Like we were just saying, get outdoors in the fresh air and walk at least 30 minutes a day. All right. Your prescription. Um, here's one you haven't heard yet. Eat a half to one cup of beans every morning. Beans, yes, beans. Beans have phytochemicals that are precursors to tryptophan, which is a neurotransmitter in the brain. So beans are really good for your brain. And there's a wide variety. So you can't say, oh, no, I don't like beans. There are so many different beans. You've got to try them and see if you like them. There's there's chickpeas and kidney beans and white beans and red beans and black turtle beans and fava beans, borlotti beans, soya beans, mung beans, and the list goes on. There's many different beans to choose from. So 
try incorporating some beans into your diet. Eat a whole ripe plant food uh, meal, um, every meal, you know, have something fresh, fresh fruit and vegetables with every meal. Definitely good for the brain. Uh, avoid visible fats in your diet. Uh, if you can eat fats, eat them as found in food like avocado, coconut, uh, olives, nuts, seeds, but avoid the, you know, the free oils or, or lards or margarines and, and butter and uh, even meats uh, with heavy, you know, cooking oil and fat. Okay, that slows the brain down. Uh, minimize or eliminate ref uh, refined foods from your diet, especially sugar. What are refined foods? Foods like um, sugar, white flour, ice cream, sodas, junk food. I'm sure you kind of know what I'm talking about. So for those of you or who are Christians um, who enjoy studying the Bible, think about this. In light of neuroplasticity, the more time we spend in studying God's word, uh, contemplating it, studying it, comparing it, assimilating it into our lives. So the more our brains are rewiring for something much higher and much more benevolent than our day-to-day -day lives that we live, uh, we can be preparing ourselves for um, eternity with our Creator. And knowing all this about the brain makes us realize and much more appreciate our God-given ability to be healed, and to be growing heavenward. All right, well, that's the end of the talk. I hope you're as excited. I'm still excited about this, and I learned about this, ooh, maybe nine years ago now. And um, I, every time I talk about it, I, I just get excited because it's so hopeful. There is hope. And now, if you have any questions. I'm putting my husband on because he's the doctor and he'll answer the questions. Thank you so much, Sister Julie. We enjoyed, I'm sure all of us enjoyed the presentation. And the last few times we've been um, discussing health topics with Dr. Clark, I keep saying this is exciting, this is exciting, and it is exciting, and it is amazing, everything that we learn, especially about the brain. Um, I always remember my dad saying marathon is run between the two ears. Um, it means it's not really in the legs and muscles as much as it is in the brain, how determined you are and um, you give up, I guess, in the brain, not in the body. So as exciting as it is, I think it also puts responsibility on our shoulders to think that we don't have an excuse uh, to not work on our characters and on our bad habits and um, yeah not to say that we can't learn things by heart and um, we can't learn new things so it is it is really good and it is exciting so we talked um, Dr. Clark about the spirituality and the brain as well last time and I remember there was an example um, I can't remember if you brought the same example or not in prison that uh, they did an experiment on two groups of people offering them to go on plant-based diet and the other group went on just the standard American diet and uh, the group that chose to go on the plant-based diet showed like less signs of aggression and they even regretted what they did. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Uh very interesting experiment for sure that makes such an impact on your personality and your character yeah so i remember that and i guess that's a it's just what um sister julie presented tonight as well is just a great example of how it affects morality um as well the diet and yeah the frontal lobe so we have we have questions. I encourage um, everyone who has questions, please type those in the chat section. Um, all right, so let's just address the first question. And that says, repetitive noises are extremely annoying to me. For example, when person next to me is constantly sniffling, is... 
Um, is there anything I can do to help myself? Yes, you know, uh, I think my dad was annoyed by lots of noises. And uh, mm -hmm. I asked him about it. What is, uh, why is that? He says, oh, it's noise pollution. <laughs> <laughs> uh, But, that's uh, so funny. Yeah, part of it has to do with uh, the uh, excitability of your brain, the irritability of, the, of your brain, the uh, threshold that you have for going from a well-balanced brain to being a brain that is off-balance. And it also has to do with what you focus on. Uh, it was uh, fascinating to me when I was in uh, residency, One of my rotations was on foot surgery. And so we spent time with this foot surgeon and uh, we would have patients coming into the office, always looking down at their feet, always complaining about their feet, always talking about where their feet hurt. And uh, toward the end of the rotation, my feet started hurting and I was kind of <laughs> like, oh no, this is embarrassing. What do I do? Well, after I finished the rotation, the, quit, the feet quit hurting, and I was kind of like, well, I'm not going to tell anybody. But in a conference, one of the other residents made that comment. You know, when I was on the foot service, uh, my feet started hurting. And we all looked at each other and said, yeah, you know, this was happening to us. And here we have all these people that are focusing on their feet and uh, having foot pain. And pretty soon we're focusing on feet, and, and we got foot pain, and there must be something, you know, psychologically wrong with us. No, it was just... Uh, mm -hmm. And so you can make a stimulus more obnoxious to you by focusing on it. Yes. And on the other hand, by focusing on something else. And this is the whole replacement theory. This is why Christianity works, because we focus on Christ instead of focusing on the problems. And so the repetitive noises, uh, when I was in... Well, when I was in high school, um, or just after high school, I lived in, I was actually assistant boys dean in a, in a dormitory, and my room somehow that they gave me was backed up right to the showers. And there was no insulation between my room and the showers, and it was a wall that was made out of metal studs and, uh, and, and, and sheetrock, dipboard, and uh, the Somebody got in the shower one night when I was already in bed, and it made this terrible racket. And I'm thinking, hmm, well, I guess this is going to be the racket. So accept the racket, and uh, this is just going to be life. I just rolled over and went to sleep and never paid any more, never after that ever realized that, that racket was there. We have friends that live uh, within uh, 200 feet or 100 feet of a railroad track. And it's quite well documented that people who live close to railroad tracks, off, uh, after time, they just zone it out. They, they, they suppress the stimulation. It no longer bothers them. And that's the case with our friends uh, uh, that we'll see in church today. Uh, 40 trains a day. 40 trains a day. And yet they zone it out. And so you have to learn to zone it out, to replace the stimulus with something else, to... Um, Practice letting your mind think on something more elevating than, than the funny noises people are making. Because if you focus on the noises, after a while, you'll hear more noises. This is the same with pain clinic. People who focus on the pain have more pain. People who focus on other things, they get over their pain. And so this goes back to what Julie said about running a marathon or what you said about running a marathon. You know, it happens more between your ears than, than in your, your arms, legs, and muscles. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, I guess, good to know. Sometimes we don't realize that maybe we've made those pathways in our brain that straight away we react maybe yeah, if there is a it. noise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, there I am. I wanted to say real quick, I have tinnitus in my ears or tinnitus, tinnitus uh -huh. ringing in my ears. I had it. I can't even remember when I didn't have it, but I've um, read. Uh, you know, some long time ago, I got curious what people, how they would deal with it. And I read that people committed suicide over that ringing in their ears. And I thought, wow, that's awful. And so I just made a decision in my brain was that I'm going to ignore it. 
and I do. It's constant. It's when I wake up, when I go to sleep, it's just, it's just constant ringing in my ears. But I just ignore it. I don't even think about it unless I think about it. And, and then I just choose to do, ignore it. But it could, I can see how people could go crazy. They could just go, ah, and, and it would drive them nuts. And mm -hmm. I, it's the same principle. You've got to change your mind. You've got to distract yourself and think about something else. For sure. Mm -hmm. Thank and you. this also goes for people who have lost their hearing. And what we have them do, besides getting on a good diet, lifestyle, and so forth, and doing some hydrotherapy, is we have them start listening to things like classical music and spend special time trying to pick out to certain sounds and training their ears. And so you can train your ears to be more per perceptive of things. It's kind of like, you know, by beholding, we become, become changed. But what we focus on, we become better at focusing on. And so after a while, you could probably find any noise in any environment that would annoy you and drive you crazy. But uh, on the other hand, you could learn to find better noises. And this sort of, sort of goes to, you know, forward to what we're going to talk about next week, which is gratitude. Mm -hmm. People who focus on what they're thankful for start finding more things for which to be thankful. And the other is true, too. People who are annoyed by everything can find more things to be annoyed about. Okay. So it's not really physical as such. It's more of a mental exercise that can be done to maybe not focus on those noises. Is that what we can get from that? Yes. Yeah. Focus on something else. That's for sure. Okay. And if it's not something in your environment, it's something in heaven. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that. So, um, <clears throat> Sister Julie mentioned about the destroyed tissue that we thought it can't recover, but it it can. What about the brain cells that are um, that are lost? Let's say from um, drinking alcohol or for any reason, brain cells may be stressed that are destroyed. Um, can brain cells recover or that um, once they're lost, they're lost? Well, actually, from Julie's talk there, when they did that to autopsy on uh, Mr. Bacarita Sr., they found out he hadn't recovered the brain tissue. He had remapped to other brain cells. And so, yes, you can mm -hmm. remap to other brain cells. You still have uh, brain cells there that can... Uh, repurpose themselves to do what uh, was needed to be done by the cells that were lost. The challenge is this, is that new cells or cells that are mapped to don't have memories of what occurred before they became remapped to this new job. And so you can lose memories that will never be recoverable because of the, of, of the damage through, through drinking or, or other things. But uh, mm -hmm. you can certainly re <clears throat> vitalize your brain to do the functions it did before you destroyed it through drinking. Mm -hmm. Wow. Or you can relearn then in that case, you can learn new skills as if you never knew, like how they, um, how he learned to walk by crawling. That's, yeah. I guess you can learn new skills as if you never knew it. Part of it has to do with having direction. You know, these people who came to Dr. Bacarita didn't know what to do themselves before he started teaching them. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of the devices he had helped. Uh, the same would be true of somebody who, who, who in some sense wanted to make changes for the better. So like Mr. Um, Finia Gage, uh, had he had somebody to help him uh, learn his moral choices again, to encourage him in that direction, of course, prayer is important too, uh, it would be assumed that he could have regained, uh, other parts of his brain could have regained the function he lost, and he could have become back to be a moral person. Um, I would suspect that, that would be the case. And so anytime you have these losses, sometimes you need somebody to help you where you have become deficient in moral strength. So that, I guess, takes me to my other question, Dr. Clark. Obviously, in his case, um, his frontal lobe, the damage was done to his frontal lobe, right? 
Um, yeah. And a lot of the times, uh, sometimes there are court cases that I have um, listened to. A lot of the times um, during these court cases, they discovered that the people that have, let's say, um, sociopathic or psychopathic tendencies or they have committed terrible crimes, they, they have um, damage to their frontal lobe. Um, is that something that can recover in that case? If your frontal lobe is damaged, then you are making um, morally poor choices. Yes, indeed. In fact, there's a doctor, Dr. Daniel Amen, out in California, who's sort of championed this research, uh, being able to scan it with a spec scan. And he'll take people whose frontal lobes have been burned out on methamphetamine or marijuana or, or caffeine. Mm -hmm. Or, or, or nicotine, he'll show initial scans showing the frontal lobes are poorly uh, perfused, have poor blood supply, and then he'll put them on a program both nutritionally uh, with supplements and with brain stimulation to straighten out the problem and then demonstrate to after a period of time that uh, on spec scan the frontal lobes re- uh, get to uh, reestablish their blood supply or improve their blood supply again. And so it can be done. It, it has been shown to be done. And so, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I suppose there's some people who have damaged their brains beyond recovery, but uh, that'd be hard to prove. I'll just give you another example. There's a, <clears throat> there was a child that was born uh, to a mother, I think it was up in Omaha, Nebraska, where the child had anencephaly, which means they had no brain. They just had the brain stem. And, uh, but the mother didn't want the child to just uh, pass away. So she started uh, massaging them and stimulating them, talking to them, uh, just uh, doing all kinds of things just to love them. And over time, their brain developed. And they started gaining functions which were thought impossible for how little brain they had. And so the brain was like growing. And uh, mm -hmm. so there's uh, definitely um, a lot of uh, potential and hope for brain damage. Wow. How interesting is that? Then in that case, if we go back to our childhood, some of the damage may be done in the childhood. Um, so I'm not sure if that means that some of the um, brain has not developed because of that, because of trauma or being mistreated. So I guess that also with correct nutrition and um, different brain exercises, maybe that can be restored as well. Yeah, no, that would, that would definitely be a case. And and of course, religiously, when we think about the fact that people were born into families where their parents abused them or neglected them or left them uh, subject to abuse and neglect of others, and we, we say right away, well, you know, you chose the wrong parents. And mm -hmm. saying, well, wait a minute, I didn't choose my parents. But you can choose your parents. You can choose a new family. You have to be born again. Mm. And then you have a new family and you have new parenting. Forget those old parents and set them aside and see what the new family's like. And the new family will help you learn and grow and develop a brain that will be suited for the environment of heaven. Wow. That's exciting. <laughs> I guess that, again, means that we don't have an excuse to not have um, the characters that we are supposed to have to take to heaven. Yeah. Well, yes, uh, that's definitely the case. You know, the Lord can fix a lot of things. There's, you know, he, he raised the dead. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Amen to that. So um, the other question, would alcohol or any forbidden substance used for a long time damage frontal lobe permanently? And uh, that kind of goes back to Daniel, amen, uh, where it looks like, uh, I mean, he's demonstrated that you can recover frontal lobe function uh, and frontal lobe uh, physiological function as well uh, through good habits and good, uh, good stimulation. So, and, and ultimately, the best thing for stimulating your brain is Bible study, associative Bible study, a comparative Bible study. For example... <clears throat> I'm not just saying read your Bible through in a year. There's nothing wrong with that. 
But more importantly is to compare text with text. An example would be, and I like, I use this example often, and that is the word rest. So maybe you take and you look in the Bible and it says, oh, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And you think, okay, rest. Where else in the Bible do I have the concept of rest? Oh, well, there's certainly the fourth commandment of Exodus uh, 20, 8 to 11. And, and God said, uh, you know, he set the Sabbath aside for rest. Okay, so there's a Sabbath day rest. And, and then Hebrews 4 compares the rest of the Sabbath to the rest of salvation. And so that's a rest. And, and then you go to Revelation 14 and it talks about that the wicked who serve the beast have no rest day or night, but the righteous who die in the Lord rest from their labors. And, uh, and so, and then you go to, you know, different parts of the Bible and you look up this whole rest concept and you think about how can I enter into that rest? How do I labor to enter into the rest? Like, like Hebrews says and and you just keep comparing back and forth and this association stimulates the brain it uh, and, and Ellen White says there's nothing more designed to get your brain stimulated and to help it than to study your Bible and so mm. this is a very important way of getting your brain power back yeah definitely it definitely is a bit of a brain exercise i remember i was reading hebrews 4 when it says they sh uh, they that's why i said they will not enter my rest i'm like oh wow how interesting it's right here do you know it's right here how do people not see this but it's like yeah sometimes you can read the same thing over and over again you might not even understand but comparing and then yeah obviously praying about it you mentioned as well the prayer very important yeah so the next question could prolonged use of alcohol uh, early onset of dementia can it be a reason i guess yes for sure that's definitely true and uh let's see uh seems like uh, did we did our uh our talk on um keeping your brain sharp right and in there, we talked about this, this fact that alcohol increases amyloid protein uh, in the brain and neurofibrillary uh, tangles. And so it increases the, the likelihood of Alzheimer's and dementia. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, Dr. Clark, I know that um, it's half past. Um, so, do you have time for more questions, or um, we should wrap it up? How are you with time? Well, let's see. Um, yeah, we probably, how about one more question, and then we'll go. Okay, awesome. Thank you. We started a bit late, so. Yeah. How to improve um, concentration? and stop our thoughts from wandering when driving and missing exits? Well, that's a very interesting question. And uh, I just want to take it in a little different direction before we get back to you know, an absolute answer here. And that is, uh, for us, we've discovered that cars are a source of massive uh, amounts of electromagnetic fields. And so when people are in these cars with massive amounts of electromagnetic fields coming from the engine, coming from the dashboard, coming from the electronics, coming from uh, the uh, cell phones in the car and so forth, that it, uh, it uh, depresses brain function. So the reason why you not, might not be thinking in the car might have to do with uh, electromagnetic fields and, and, and they will damage the brain and, and, and cause it not to function well but uh, other than that uh, given the fact that you know that you miss exits and that you think about it that way one thing of course is to use your electronic device to to turn on the gps so it tells you when to exit but uh also you can uh, uh take and 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 do uh things that to uh, help you concentrate okay all right there's usually mile markers along the road okay looks like i'm uh, three miles from my or three kilometers from my exit now so i better be paying attention okay the next uh, mile mark uh, kilometer marker is coming up or 
and, and so I, you can find things to focus on that are, are tips for uh, getting close to your exit. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you hate to think that you have to concentrate that much on driving, but a lot of us uh, probably let driving be a little bit too uh, non-cerebral, and that's why we, you know, we start focusing on other things. And, and it's true, people will focus on what's around them. We have this drive we make from a town north of here to our house, and it, we were, at, you know, commenting the other day, I wonder if this, this highway has the most billboards of any highway in the world. <laughs> it just it's just lots of billboards and it's distracting and mm -hmm. so you say okay i'm not going to look at the billboards i'm going to look at the cars look at their license plates look at the look at the uh you know the scenery and and or other things other than all these you know obnoxious billboards and again so it's a, it's a different focus and 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 thinking and so uh part of it then is yeah finding things to focus on that are clues to your environment and your your responsibility of getting off at the next uh, exit rather mm -hmm. than perhaps on other things. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Dr. Clark. And obviously we have more questions, um, but perhaps we can either email them to you or on the next presentation we can address that as well, um, those questions, because they are somehow um, linked obviously, uh, with the gratitude presentation as well, um, all these questions. And, um, yeah, you mentioned as well that um, I remember you had a presentation on 3ABN when you were talking about um, remembering things and um, you said about learning the Bible as well, like learning the Bible verses by heart. And um, I'm assuming, I, I guess, reading is not the same as listening, is it? Um, listening doesn't give you the same, um, you know, concentration and you can't learn as well. Oh, no, I would say listening is fine, too. You know, this is Revelation 1 where it says, Blessed is he that readeth and he that uh, heareth. <laughs> um, for some people, audio learning is their preferred uh, learning uh, uh, modality. Mm -hmm. And so there's nothing wrong with, with listening. I do a lot of listening. And, uh, you know, and even listening to preachers, the, the caveat on listening to preachers is that your next step is to verify it like the Bereans with your word of God, make sure they didn't lead you astray. <laughs> but yes. uh, listening is, is good. We, we, you know, we're told that we should, uh, 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 what is it? Uh, um, don't let these words depart out of the mouth. That's a, whatever you're supposed to review them as you sit down at meals and as you get up and you know, there's all these different uh, places, you know, Deuteronomy talks about always be studying the word. And so we, we at uh, mealtimes often listen to a speaker uh, or, or, or some uh, pre-recorded, uh, you know, reading of something. And uh, that way we're using our time well and uh, getting the blessing from the word. Okay. I guess it has its place. No problem. Thank you so much, Dr. Clark and Sister Clark. We are very grateful for the information presented. I think we were all very blessed with that and hopefully we can implement um, this, the good advice and um, yeah, improve our brain function. Um, so the next presentation is obviously on gratitude and we're looking forward to learning more about our attitude and um, how we can improve our characters and um, habits. Amen. Okay, thank you very much. We will see you next uh, time. And Dr. Clark, um, would, could we ask you to have a word of prayer, please, before you go? Yes, let's go. Uh, dear Father in heaven, we're thankful for this time we could spend this morning thinking about the brain and the possibilities it's very encouraging and uh, some people might be thinking that they've destroyed their brains or the brains aren't working as well as they used to and so through good the lifestyle habits and uh, mental exercise and physical exercise we see that uh, this is not a dead end uh that uh, they can improve and so we pray lord that you bless each one that wants to improve that they'll apply themselves to these principles and that they'll come out with results that can honor you and we thank you in his name. Amen. Amen.
thank you again and um god bless we will see you next um saturday evening and of course saturday morning for you yeah we'll see you then okay bye then Goodbye. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Thank you for the questions and the support. Um, please join us next time as well, Saturday evening, 8 o'clock, same time. So this will be our last presentation, the presentation on gratitude. It will be the last one for the month. Um, in June, we have a mental health month where we will have different presenters, psychologists, counsellors, doctors, and um and pastors, different um, presenters. So that is also very exciting. We're going to learn more about brain health, about depression, anxiety, and different techniques that we can implement um, to improve our brain function. So we are looking forward to that. But before that, um, next Saturday evening, we have another presentation on gratitude, and we are looking forward to seeing you all then. Thank you so much. God bless and see you next time.